that this is what we're talking about. I'm Terry David Mulligan. This is the TDM YouTube channel. We're talking about O Sun O Moon, the 38th album from Bruce Coburn. 38. But before we get to the album, Bruce and I did the interview on Zoom May 1st. May the 2nd, we all discovered that Gordon Lightfoot had passed away. Bruce was seven years behind Gordon Lightfoot in terms of getting on stage. But he watched Gordon, he, he learned from Gordon about songs and how to captivate an audience. And um, he's going to reminisce on his friend, Gordon Lightfoot. And then, and then, about seven, eight, ten minutes in, we're going to switch to O Sun O Moon and check out his life as we see it today. It's a Gordon Lightfoot, Bruce Coburn. Two episodes right here on the Mulligan Stew podcast. Enjoy. I'm Terry David Mulligan. He's Bruce Coburn. Uh, we are talking, well, we were in conversation in real time yesterday, uh, May the 1st, uh, about Osano Moon, um, this new album right there. But then we rang off and went about our separate ways, did what we do. Uh, and we both discovered at pr 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 precisely at the same time that Gordon Lightfoot had passed. And I asked if you would uh, return and just give me your thoughts and comments on, on, on Gordon. Um, when had you last seen him or talked to him? How long ago? Um, I don't remember if it was last summer, but I think the summer before um, we at the Mariposa Festival in Ontario, um, he made a point actually of coming up. I, I, I had finished my set and I'm back on the tour bus and I, somebody's knocking on the door of the bus and, I, and I'm, I'm going, oh, geez, you know, because he expected to be something you don't want to deal with or or it just seemed intrusive and uh, maybe autograph seekers or something that's a festival and people have access media, to a lot of those, things. Or, those media people. Wretched media people, yeah. But, um, but you know, the, it was very persistent and so I opened the door and there's and it, and it was Gordon. <laughs> and, and his wife and some other friends and so I you know I was like okay I'm feeling a little sheepish but we had a very nice chat he you know he was full of nice things to say and and uh very friendly he's always I, I didn't know him very well um but I uh had ran into him you know numerous times over a long time and uh he was always very gracious and, and cordial with me so I you know, I, and I appreciated that. Um, when when he started out, he had a profound effect actually on me and my friends, uh, who, who, all, all the budding folkies sort of at the at the time. He was half a generation ahead, and that much well, not that not half a generation, not that much older than me, but but uh, uh, older enough that you know he had been out there paying dues when we, we hadn't we were only beginning to wonder which dues we were supposed to be paying yes and uh uh he came through and played at lady boo in ottawa and it was mind-blowingly good and it, and it's like this guy from Aurelia, ontario like what and <laughs> but but it was like i mean it, there was no no question about him he was just he was amazing and this writing beautiful songs playing what at the time was considered totally solid guitar, uh, and uh, that actually was. I, I actually put on his first album this morning and and uh, listened to it, and uh, and it's a great record. Yeah, it's like there's not one bad song on it. Uh, it. There's some really nice guitar playing. He played very solidly, but also, but he had a lead player, Red somebody. I forget his last name. Uh, that toured with him and played with him all the time. And the album is just the, the trio that he toured with pretty much. Yeah. Uh, so it, it, it brought back how powerful an effect he had on me, uh, not just because he was good, but because of the content of his songs. Like there was so much Canada in his songs. 
uh, so much of what I, I mean, you, you could apply it to other places, but for, in my frame of reference, there was a lot of nature and the nature that he described, the references he made were to, to the Canadian landscape as I understood it. And I, it really opened a window for me, like, or something it, it, it opened, it opened a, a door of possibility, like, Oh, you can write songs like that. Like, because the, these were songs that were just as good as any, any of the uh, famous American singer songwriters were coming up with. Uh, but they, they had a distinctly Canadian stamp about them. And, and it, it just seemed like, the cosmos was was presenting <laughs> in Gordon an invitation to kind of get in there and, and do similar things. That's how I felt about it, and I, and I, I mean, with hindsight, is how I feel about it. At, at the time, it just was like I, it was it was really cool, and I just really wanted to do things like that too. So you know, there were I had other influences, of course, but uh, and I was you know had had many influences by the time I heard him the first time, but but. Uh, that was that had a powerful effect on me so you know that's that's been in in my picture of him all these years the the the, the first time i actually was that the first time i met him i think i probably met him at some award show somewhere or something i'm not even sure maybe in Mar i guess in miracles if it, when it was on toronto island in the in the in the late 60s or early 70s but uh when, at one point he was playing, how did this happen? I went to hear somebody at the Horseshoe in Toronto, which was, which was a country music club at the time. It became kind of more of a rock bar after that. But but um, I forget who was playing, I think, oh, it was George Hamilton IV, who had recorded a song of mine, which I played on in the studio. And he was playing that night at the this thing. So he's there with this very stereotypical country band and uh, he was very, a very gracious individual, actually, too. But, but uh, anyway, at one point, Gordon happened to be there too, and and so George invites Gordon up on stage to do a song with his band, yeah. not with George. George George vacated the stage and left it to Gordon. So there's Gordon, but the only guitar that was there that he that he could play, I mean, that was available for him to play, was a, a Telecaster electric guitar, and I don't. Only ever seen him play acoustic, and at the time we were all very judgmental about mixing electric instruments with folk music. And so, so I'm, uh, I was there with Murray McLaughlin, I think, and whoever you know, our, our our wives, and we're sitting kind of in the front row next to the stage. And Gordon looks down and he sees me looking at him, and he must have seen the look of disapproval on my face, and and he he said. Just you wait, kid. This, you're going to be doing this one day. <laughs> <laughs> and it was like, but it was it was a kind response to to that. And he knew exactly what I was feeling. I'm sure, and he probably had had many conversations around that sort of stuff with people because everyone did back then. But but it just it, it, I have a, a good memory of that. I, uh, it's a slightly embarrassing memory for me to be caught out being judgmental, but. But uh, but it's a great memory of him. So I can remember him telling me a story about um, when when the CBC shot a video for the Canadian Railroad trilogy. He said I was out there all day. It was miserable. I was cold. Oh, I didn't really want to be there, but I was there. But when the dancers pulled out paper mache sledgehammers, I left. I was gone. I, I it was it was not the song that I wrote. There weren't dances <laughs> with paper mache hammers. There was, there was none of that. I just, I said, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I don't recognize my own song. And he, he went home. He went home. Um, oh, he, I, he had a lot of integrity. I, I, I you know, that, I, th I think you kind of felt that from him just by, it, it, when it, at least seeing him on stage. He always radiated that. Sure. Uh, anytime I saw him. And, and, um, you know, yeah, I, it's it's interesting, and the CBC as a reflection on certain aspects of the CBC. Yes, yes. <laughs> two, two, two two things. One is, uh, did you ever get a chance in in the times that you did meet him to to talk about songwriting, or was it the last thing you were going to talk about? 
Um, I, I never really had an in-depth conversation with him about anything. I wasn't, I, 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 we were in the same room at the same time fairly often. And uh, there were a couple of times when we chat, but it was pretty, you know, hi, how are you doing level chatting? Got it. Got it. Um, and you mentioned um, Canada and the fact that he was writing about Canada and things that we knew. Uh, we, we know when we hear songs from Scotland or Ireland or a, a song songwriting from Paris or, or or the city of New Orleans, for example, you know that. Can we? Uh, I I've seen comments, and I kind of believe in it that uh, Canada has a has a sound. Um, I may be stretching the point. Uh, the high harmonies from Blue Rodeo remind me of the prairies. They just do the the, the distance, the space. Is is that asking too much of Gord's songs to represent us as a, as a sound. I, I don't think they're the only thing that does, but I, but yes, I, I think there is, it's, it's a hard one to define. Yeah. The distinction between Canada, can, the Canadian sound and, and any place else. But yeah. I would include in that Joni Mitchell and, and, and Leonard Cohen. I mean, and uh, Neil Young to some extent, I mean, certainly a song like, uh, helpless. Helpless, for instance, I mean, is archetypally Northern Ontario, you know, uh, but uh, it's physically speaking. Uh, so it's, uh, yeah, I, but, and I don't think, I don't, it's somehow not an accident that none of those artists came out of the States, although all of us have been influenced hugely by American music. I mean, but the traditional music and the commercial music and, and everything else. And, so you can't really uh, not include that in the picture, but the, but somehow what happens, when, and you hear it in, in Lightfoot stuff, has has more. It's more obvious in the more acoustic uh, range of the music. The more the more it gets to sound like rock and roll, the less I hear it. Although that's not to say it isn't there because I I don't think the, the tragically hip would have ever come out of the United States either for instance I, it's just there's something um yeah States has has great songwriters I mean Tom Waits is a great songwriter but I can't imagine Canada giving birth to Tom Waits <laughs> somehow it just doesn't no I haven't heard it anyway and and you know I've been around a while but um uh, I, I've heard people that sound like him, but that was after he sounded like that. And sure. so it's, it's uh, uh, you know, what we've brought to it uh, as Canadians is, is something that is our own. And that's, there's a thoughtfulness, I think, too, a, a depth of, uh, what's, I don't even, language fails me here because we're talking about the nature imagery and stuff, but the, which is part of it. I don't hear much of that in American music, American songwriting. It must, there's probably lots of it there. There's tens of thousands of American songwriters that I haven't heard, but, uh, but the, the way it, the relationship, uh, Margaret Atwood talked about this in a book at one point, a, a study of kind of the, the way nature f figures in, early Canadian novels was, that was the subject of her book. Yeah. Uh, but I think the same applies to the music in the, in the novels, it's, it's more explicit. It's like you have a uh, novel after novel in the uh, sort of early days of Canada as a, as a functioning culture um, that sort of have tiny man in the face of enormous, frequently threatening nature um or at least nature that has to be um uh, whose effects have to be overcome uh, and and there, that's uh, th that same sense of na of man in the presence of nature it's a respect for the, the for the scope of things it doesn't I, we don't see ourselves as a nation of conquerors and and i think that shows up in the songwriting yes it does yes it does um, I'm, I'm going to leave with a tune um, on the Gord Tribute album that came out years ago. 
Did you do Ribbon of Darkness? I did. It's a song I I, I loved it the first time I heard it. I, I felt it. I, I felt a twinge of kinship <laughs> with the, 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 the what that song expresses, and it was nice to to get a chance to record it. Did you ever sing it with Gord in the audience? No. No. <laughs> I would have if it had ever come up. I, I don't know. I, I doubt I ever sang it live in front of anyone. Um, but uh, but it's a great song, and, and Colin, Lyndon, and I had fun making, putting, getting it on a record. Well, Mr. Lightfoot is gone now, but the, what a legacy he's left us. Yeah, and that's not going to go away. It's a bittersweet to hear Bruce Coburn talk about Gordon Lightfoot as though he's passed on, which he has. And it's hard to put into place the value of Gordon Lightfoot in today's music. But in Canadian music, in Canada, the voice of the nation. In one way or another, Gordon Lightfoot, instantly recognizable, as is Bruce Coburn. And this is this is really why we got a, a, in touch with each other. Thank you, Bernie, to uh, have a conversation about O Sun O Moon, his thirty eighth album. Here's that conversation now. Hello, Bruce. Um, I I welcome you back to. Uh, well, actually, I welcome you back to uh, Canadian radio. Um, uh, we're going to talk about this not just yet, not off the top, but. I just want you to know that there's a place where your music lives. It's called CKUA. And there are, whoever sits on the chair is playing the music that they know best. It's their show for their hour or two. And they live with this music. This is what they, they want to play rockabilly. They want to play classical. They want to play indigenous. They play what they play. Uh, and most of them find a way to find cover music in their lives. It's fantastic. So well, nice to hear that. And I know that for artists, it's really tough out there to find a place if you're not, if you don't want to do um, the, the Taylor Swift, for example, or, or the ilk. If you just want to be true to yourself, you, you have to find media somewhere, somehow, some way. Um, do you, yeah. does this concern you? Is it, is it something that you give thought to? Yeah, well, I, I don't spend a lot of time trying to figure anything out. Yeah, but but uh, I I'm certainly aware of it, and I'm grateful to CK. Wait, actually, that gratitude goes way back to the very early '70s when when I first encountered that station, and and they, they were playing me then, and it's it's very nice to know that that that, that continues. But the um, but yeah, in general, uh, the window that we had. Not, I guess you wouldn't even call it a window because radio was a lot broader in general in its uh, in the in the kinds of things you could encounter on it uh, North America wide than it is now, and uh, I mean the the mainstream. I I listen to the pop stations because I'm driving my daughter to school in the mornings, yeah. you know, and that's what she likes to hear. So I hear Doja Cat and I hear I hear t um, Ed Sheeran and all the rest. And and some of it is pretty good. I have quite quite a lot of respect for Taylor Swift, um, among others. But but uh, some of them, some of it's just like <laughs> just... I I shudder. And and yet, you know, I think of okay, uh, along with the stuff with the rock and roll that I loved, you know, in, when it, when I was starting to listen to music at the age of 12, 13, whatever. And I'm, I was completely obsessed with Elvis Presley and to some extent with Buddy Holly and the Crickets. So which which were really, though that music still stands up, but some of the other music that I thought was cool at the time, uh, you know, is, it sounds ridiculous when you hear it now. And, and you know, I, so I have to, I have to be patient with, with the daughter, with, with the radio that my daughter likes to hear because I put my parents through the same thing. Yeah. Do you do you uh, harmonize? Do you hit the high har or low harmony? Can... <laughs> on the Taylor Swift songs, no, I can no. never figure out all the lyrics. But it, but the the I mean I I think that uh, while I'm on the topic of lyrics, I 
one of the things that makes me respect her is that I, I my daughter's been listening to her for some time, a couple of years, and and Swiss lyrics are 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 maturing, as she presumably is also, and and that's a good sign. I mean, it's because she's really good at all the other stuff, like at putting that kind of record together. She's she's extremely good at it. So yeah, great. It's not me. It's not my thing. Same thing applies to you, Bruce. Your your fans, your listeners are maturing as well, as am I. <laughs> I'd say we're pretty well matured by now. Yeah, yeah, yes. We, 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 we don't see. taste right by now, we're not going. <laughs> and, and I know that you might not believe that uh, there would be new fans, but there are uh, moms and dads and grandparents who do play your music and others in their cars or in their house, and that's how that's and, and that's what they tell us uh, at CKUA when we get feedback to our fundraising that they grew up listening to and I'm passing it on to my kids. Just this music. You can take it if you want it. You can leave it alone if you want. Here it is. You you need to know that this exists. I, I believe uh, I may have a little more faith in that in the human system in, in that in that end in terms of music and and what we leave behind. Well, uh, you know, whatever works is is a wonderful thing. I. I... I don't, uh, I mean, I, I don't feel personally threatened by the change in, in radio access. Uh, you know, I, I, I am where I am, yeah. you know, what I do, et cetera, et cetera. But, but, uh, I, I think about it more in, in terms of younger artists, like how do you get started now? And if you're depending on what you're doing, I mean, if you want to do the kind of stuff that gets on pop radio, then, Okay, I guess there's a mechanism for doing that, which I'm not aware of, but and don't pay any attention to. But the idea, I mean, how do you get an audience uh, except through word of mouth? And the word of mouth, I guess, I mean, in the era of, of all, all the various uh, social media, there's plenty of word of mouth of, of that sort. And maybe that counts for a lot. I, I'm not really sure now because I, again, I don't pay that much attention. <laughs> um, yeah. What number is this officially? If we're gonna, uh, well, I, th I think it's officially number thirty-eight, but that includes a couple of compilations and stuff. So yeah, that's uh, true. Sure. It's Osano Moon. That's what you want to know about, uh, friends. Bruce Coburn, new music. Although what I'm sure when you tour, as you have done and will do, I just saw some more dates, your June dates kicking off. Um, mm -hmm. They'll come for the new tunes. They'll come for the new tunes. They will welcome the new tunes. But then when you lay into your <laughs> bevy of hits, uh, uh, there's recognition, there's connection, there's reconnection. Uh, how How much do you dwell in... Uh, the old uh, first first five six albums. Do you still? Uh, I don't dwell in them. I, I w the more recent touring that I've done was sort of the continuation of the fiftieth anniversary tour. I, I'm considering that done now because there's a new album out, yep. and we're on to the next. But but the, because it was a fiftieth anniversary tour, I made a point of looking back at at various older things from the seventies, let's say, and eighties uh that were not ones that i'd been doing a lot previously because i've always mixed it up in my shows I've, there's always been one or two older things as, along with everything else and along with the familiar ones that people will feel cheated if they don't get to hear and and then whatever i whatever else i want to do and so the these shows are are no exception but but i wanted to pick some different older stuff for the for the 50th anniversary tour ones that people hadn't heard me do at least for a long time so i pulled in something like let us go laughing for instance off the second album and uh, some other some other older stuff but and i'm i'm kind of doing that again but i'm not paying attention to spanning the 50 years particularly okay here's what we uh, here's what i know you for and what i go to bruce Coburn for and that is uh, language and the context of the language, the words. They they place themselves in my heart. 
But I kind of wonder, it caused a question that popped up in my brain. When did you become aware of the power of words? How far oh, back? I think I was in grade six. Uh, the first time I read a poem that really grabbed me. And and I and I mean we had had poetry before that in school, of course, but you know it was all the highwayman went came riding, riding, riding. You know, it was rhyming ballads. Anyway, that that has its own power too, but it didn't didn't really get me. It was interesting, but not more than that. But I came across, uh, uh, I think I think in in sixth grade we had to memorize a poem, and one of I probably picked it because it was short. But uh, one, of the, one of the poems that I thought was interesting was this poem by Archibald MacLeish called Ars Poetica that was in the textbook we were, we, we were learning from. And, uh, and so I memorized that. And it, but it, I, I was really drawn to it because it, it didn't tell a story. It just evoked a feeling and a sense of, there was, it had strong visual imagery and I can't I can't recite it for you now, but uh, it's it it's basically describing what a poem should be, uh. and and I, it just but that the message wasn't what got me. It was the way the message was delivered, and 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 it had no rhyme. It had just this these open ended images that left you able to kind of float on them everywhere, and and I. Soon after that, discovered T.S. Eliot and Dylan Thomas, and I got it's like, okay, we're on, we're we're moving here now. And had you picked up a guitar at that point? No. Okay, fine. I was taking music lessons, but uh, but I think I'd taken a year of clarinet and just switched to trumpet. I mean, oh, the music God. didn't really mean much to me. Was it? Oh, was there an epiphany when you finally put the words and the music together? Um, let me think about that for a minute. It it I wouldn't call it an epiphany exactly it was it took longer than what i would think of by that word but uh, uh but it there was definitely a discovery um i i dabbled in writing poetry because i loved poetry and i was learning to compose music once once i got seriously involved in music which was a bit later um you know i was i studied composition and then and under the influence of the singer songwriters and and the folk artists of the '60s, really, uh, I I thought you know maybe I should try putting the poetry and the music together because you know I'm trying to do both. But and and I dropped out of music school, stopped studying, and I joined a band. And nice, that's nice. I was writing songs, you know, so so I was too. I told my father I was no longer a Mountie. What are you going to do? I'm going to be a disc jockey, Dad. <laughs> I love to picture you as a Mountie. That's great. <laughs> There's a shot here somewhere. Um, and he hung up and didn't talk to me for a couple of years. Um, Sorry about that. At the end, at the end, in that last conversation, he said, your life, it turned out okay. I said, yes, Dad, it turned out okay. It turned out okay. Say hello to Mom. Um a co-write caught my eye right away. Susan Glukark and yourself. Yeah. Uh, I can't remember the last one, but this is good to see. This is really cool. How did it come about? I know that she would not be in San Francisco. So she did her, her writing and, and voice uh, her vocals somewhere else. Yeah. Uh, we did it over the phone more or less. Right. I mean, wrote the song um, over the phone and by email. And, uh, she, um, it was her idea actually, which uh, I kind of jumped at because, first of all, she's interesting, and and I met her and I liked her based on the very limited degree to which I knew her, and and I I thought it'd be fun, I and, and it was. Um, I haven't done very many collaborations over the many years, and uh, it just seemed, seemed like the invitation was one that should be accepted uh, for that alone just because it was interesting but I'm, it was interesting further that it was susan and and uh so yeah i mean she had the idea and then i wrote some stuff and sent it back to her and what do you think and, and she added a couple of things and sent it back and said what do you think about these things and it went back and forth like that 
And we ended up with a set of lyrics and, and I came up with some music for it, at which uh, I managed to find some limitedly technological way to send to her because I'm not Mr. Technology, but, but uh, and she liked that. And so then, so we were away. And then when it, when it came time to record it, the album was recorded at Colin Linden's place in Nashville. But, um, but uh, you know, Susan, nowadays you don't need to be there to record there. So, so Susan was able to just, we sent the files to her and she added her parts and, and sent them back. And you had a commonality. You were singing about the world we know. Well, the idea, yeah, Susan's idea was was based on all the wildfires. Yeah. And the fact that, that I mean, specifically too, including, which isn't quite the same thing, the, the, the Ikaloi phenomenon where there, there was some kind of underground leakage of toxic something or other that was blowing flames out of people's kitchen taps. Yeah. And, and uh, that I mean, I remember a scene. There's a scene like that in that Jack Nicholson movie, The Two Jakes, uh, where that happened in L.A. Right? And may, may, that may have been fiction or may not. I don't know. But but um, in this case, it certainly wasn't, and it just seemed unrelated to climate change, but related to lack of concern for the state of the planet, and and therefore fitting to include in the song. And it, so, yeah, it was fun to write. I, I realize that I, I get uh, uh, like others, but I get hung up on lyrics and songs and, and try not to, you can't dive too deep. We only have a limited amount of time uh, and, and this ground to cover. Um, but when the spirit walks in such a great groove, I, did it start with the groove or was it the thought? Um, it started with the words like they all do. Uh, some of the words, I think uh, usually what happens is I'll, I'll get a verse or two that went, and if they've taken enough shape to actually be that, sure. then I then I look for music. And in this case, the music kind of just jumped in. It was, it was I had hold of the guitar, and I, I'm thinking those words and that tune, the tune and the guitar part just kind of fell into it. It didn't take much thought. I also I, I also try not I also try not go ahead carry on. No, that, I, I'm just finishing up, and and th then I added the rest of the words out, uh, you know, some somewhere in there. So. Oh, you want to finish your your thoughts and your ideas? Oh, I, could, I can't. Get <laughs> what a concept! What a concept! <laughs> um, uh, there's a term called mid Atlantic man. Uh, one foot in the UK or Europe, and one foot in North America, so to speak. Uh, and I wrote down, "You're the 49th man. You've got a border, one foot, and the border on the other." Uh, San Francisco and Toronto and Canada. Um, but you are, when you write, you are borderless. You are writing about the world, are you not? Your world. I yeah, I feel like I'm a citizen of the world. I I, I mean, I'm I'm proud to be Canadian, and I, I'm enjoying being an American. But I but I am proud of that too, in a way. But it but but the, uh, I'm, you know, I feel like I'm part of the human race <laughs> more than anything else, and and you know, I feel a connectedness with with the rest of my species uh sometimes that's a very painful thing to feel and sometimes it's great but but it's 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 what it is regardless i'm going to ask you two questions uh one is uh so does that include us all i love that i love the track by the way thank you um you pretend to know what it is that you're where it started the genesis it's yeah us all. i mean that's that's the observation we're all in this together it's, all it's, in this together Somebody, I read this uh, this quote the other day. I don't remember who said it, but so, somebody says you know, that we're, we're we're not passengers on on spaceship Earth. We're the crew, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so yes, absolutely. Um, what, there was I made a note here about. Uh, whew, you've been doing this. You've been working with uh, Colin Linden for some 30, 30 years, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. And you have yeah. both walked your separate roads, done your music, spent many hours creating this music for us. Uh, but you are you seem now here's what here's the deal. Uh, I've I've saw you early on when you're first starting. I've watched various I don't I can't see it all, obviously 
if unless I was living next door. But you seem now um, wonderfully settled in 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 your Bruceness, uh, <laughs> in your uh, your write, songwriting process, your thoughts, uh, revealing of yourself. Uh, and, and 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 then again, I try to put it in perspective. It's his career. It's his job. This is what he does. He's driven to do this. It's not like he's making too many choices here. This, the music carries the day. Uh, do I did I get any of that right? Yeah, I mean, I, I, it's I'm I'm the only real material I've got to write about. Yes, and, but and what I mean by that is that yeah. that it my, it's my observation of the world. Yeah. The things that touch me, the things I think of, the things I feel—that's that's the material. And I, I think that you know the basic ingredients of our lives don't vary that much from one to another. There's, I mean, this, the surface does quite a, a lot, but but you know, b birth, death, and and getting through the, the in between is pretty. We so, it's something we pretty much have in common. So you know, my experiences are. And my way of describing them to people may be uh, may resonate with their experience. I expect they do, and so that I, well, I have good evidence they do for some people at least. But uh, and that's you know that it's there's a universality in in there, and the trick is to get down through your own stuff and and tap into that, and and that. So that's what I try to do. But uh, you know, I guess sometimes it works. Some people might say it doesn't. Sometimes I'm not sure. Bruce Coburn is a uh, 38th, 38th album. Osano Moon. Um, you mentioned the word resonance, re resonance. Um, I know what it's like for, for us. And I think I have, I know enough of your music fans to, to know what, how they feel sitting in those seats. Uh, take me on stage with you. Uh, starting with the 10, 12, 15 steps to the chair to the microphone, to the light. What are the, do you, are you conscious of those fifteen steps? Yeah, I'm trying to stand up straight. Which yes, is that's right. Very difficult for me to do, and and so I, I'm conscious of my posture when I'm walking those fifteen steps more than anything else. And then gracefully getting on the stool without like falling over or knocking something over. But but uh, I'm I, by that time I've done my sort of psychological prep like, uh, if i can call it that um you know i've had a glass of whiskey and i and i've uh been thinking about it and, and, and done a lot of warm-up for, for on the guitar so hopefully i'm able to execute the first song with some grace and and that's that's really the concern get through the first one and then generally you're kind of away after that and then when they welcome you and when they continue to welcome you and you can see them, some people would might be dabbing at their eyes. They, they might they're certainly sing <laughs> along, whatever, holding a hand, whatever. What comes over you during the course? Well, I, I, it, I feel well. Go away. I mean, do, are you still with us? <laughs> yeah, no, I was definitely with you. Uh, the, 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 um, I, the, the only time I go away is if I get really transported, usually in the instrumental pieces. There's some a piece like uh, The End of All Rivers where I can really kind of stretch out. I might be transported to some extent. And if I'm playing with a band, that, the, the energy of the band can be that, can, transporting like that. But in general, the whole point of being there is to be with the audience. And the music becomes a vehicle for this kind of sharing that takes place in, uh, between me and the audience. So I can't generally see people and it, it depends on the size of the place and, and the kind of lighting there is, but um, in a small club, you can see people's faces, but in a theater, generally the lights are in my eyes and all I see is a big black hole with all this energy in it, you know, and the energy is great and the energy feels warm. I mean, m most of the time, if it doesn't, then it's a little disconcerting. But but uh, it's you know I get the welcome you're talking about and what you're describing is is a great thing to walk into and uh, you know it's what as I sort of calm down from 
the slight jitters of doing, you know, doing the first song, like it just feels really good. And it builds from there. And, you know, I mean, this is on a good day, which is most of them. Um, by the end, you know, the, that same feeling is there, only it's intensified. And, uh, you know, hopefully we all, me and the audience, all walk away with the yeah. sense that something good happened. It's beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. I want to go back to when the spirit walks in the room, because I love the song. The song made a mark on me right away, right away. Um, and the word spirit, you are a spiritual individual. Um, you have your own version of uh, Christianity. Um, I don't recognize Christianity currently, uh, certainly in the United States of America. Uh, I know. <laughs> There's some, there's some serious stuff going down in the name yeah. of. Yes, there's some major delusions. Jesus, uh, it's Jesus is a weapon almost. It's just it's yeah. astonishing. Yeah, well, it's not the first time in history that that's showed up. Sure. It's been a, a tendency among the among yeah. Christian societies. Uh, and I, I'm stressing that because individual Christians are frequently free of that. Uh, as I consider myself to be, but the but the 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 social phenomenon of Christianity as a as a cult and the cultural phenomenon has proved itself capable of great evil over and over again, and and we're we kind of look like we're heading back into one of those, which really I I'm very d distressed to see, but uh, but at the same time the, the only the only thing I can do about that is to uh, offer people some kind of vision of what it's supposed to be. Um, I'm not in a position to be as specific about that or as knowledgeable as as, sure. as the pastor of the church I go to, for instance, or any number of others. But, um, but you know, I've, I, I've experienced what I've experienced and felt the truth that I've felt, and, and those end up in songs. That's, that's how I can address any of this. Thank you. The title song, Osano Moon, notice how I just keep going. Osano Moon, uh, the strings in it, well, the instrumentation was fantastic. And, and I, so it caused me to go back and listen three or four times to not just listen to you and the words, but the texture in behind you. I love that. I love the, by the way, have I mentioned that this is a fabulous album? I'll, I'll say it now. This is, this, this is I, I may have said this before on previous albums, but uh, this th something came together here, something with you internally, externally. It just came together. Did it feel like that in studio? Could you tell? In the studio, less so. But some of the songs felt like that. When the spirit walks in, there was an example of that, and also um, into the now, which was the first of a whole bunch of songs that I ended up writing uh, in Maui uh, a couple of Julys ago. And and um, that that song, it it felt like a real gift, and and the same with when the spirit walks in the room. The others, the others came in bits and pieces, and and uh, well, actually, Colin went down to the water. It was another one of those, but not a not a happy one particularly because it it was written be, because a friend of mine drowned while we were in Maui. Not he wasn't part of our group that tra was traveling there. He lived there, but. Uh, he was this avid scuba diver, and he came to grief doing that. And so that's uh, that, that's where that song came from. But but and it's a different kind of gift. But uh, but you know, those two songs in particular uh, really felt like everything just kind of coalesced. And and in the studio, I I it was more like here we are. You know, we're doing this stuff. We recorded. Me and Gary Craig the, on drums and percussions. Of course, uh, the two of us recorded all the songs, and then we brought in other people to add parts. And as as, as they came in, and you know, here and there, here and there, uh, the songs kept developing. And I, I'm, some of it was t to me like wonderfully shocking, like the stuff that Jim Hope, the guy who did all the horn arrangements, and and plays all the all the horns and the marimba. Yeah, um, it was just amazing to me. And and Jeff Taylor, who who 
plays the accordion uh, and uh, dulciola, which is a kind of weird hybrid mini high harpsichord like thing. Uh, the, I mean, it, the stuff, what he brought to it, it was just so beautiful and, and so completely appropriate without having to really mold it at all. I mean, sometimes people do great stuff, but you got to kind of push and prod a little bit to make it fit. But but in this in the case of both those guys, it was just wonderful to work with them and, and wonderful to hear what they were going to do. Jenny Scheinman showed up as an accident, a cosmic accident, you know, like she happened to have another reason to be in Nashville at the right time. And so she was able to come in and put on the violin parts. And, and uh, I mean, the, the others, I mean, we had, Colin and I had talked about who to kind of have as guests. And... Uh, Alison Russell. Alison Russell. Sarah Jarosa. Uh, Sarah Jarosa, those two in particular, but and Buddy Miller, you know... Uh, Buddy just, freaking Miller. Excuse me, Buddy freaking Miller. Yeah, <laughs> he's a great guitar player. He's a good guy, and 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 uh, and, and a good singer. And he was he we had, we had a good time with, with all of these people. They were they were all incredibly gracious and and uh, giving of their time. And Sean Colvin didn't come in in person. She 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 like Susan put her her part on from a distance. But in that case, at least we were we had a, a link up between the studios she was in in Austin and. And uh, our setup in in Nashville, and so we could at least see each other. But okay. uh, yeah, it was great. Um, I'll say these two things and uh, see what the reaction might be. One is, despite all of the turmoil uh, in our lives, your lives, the world's lives, you seem to have found the center of your humanity. You keep it, which is one of the things that attracts me to you and your music is your humanity. Should, should we even talk about that or just leave it alone? I, there's no escaping it. I mean, <laughs> it's like, well, how do you, as you know, you, we're all surrounded by cynicism. I, I'm just saying. Yeah. I, I, I don't, uh, I, I don't feel slightly cynical. I mean, I'm skeptical of a lot of stuff and I, and I think it's appropriate to be, but I, I, I find and even when I look around at the miserable crap we're inflicting on each other, I still feel a hopefulness and I still feel a positive feeling toward my fellow humans and, and myself, in fact. So, you know, I mean, I, I'm as, as self-critical as I am critical of anything else outside me. But, but I, uh, uh, under all that is this feeling that I feel things are unfolding as they must. And uh, in my own life, I'm I'm really sure of that. In the world in general, I'm not so sure. But but uh, it, it's more of a struggle, of, uh, you know, in the exterior world. And again, again, a long distance observation. Uh, judging these wonderful songs, you are comfortable in your own skin. Well, that might be overstating it slightly, but uh, but <laughs> I'm I'm more comfortable than I ever used to be. We can put it that yes. way. Yes. Yes. There's a different kind of discomfort takes hold. Yes. Now, in leaving you, I hate to do that, but I'll leave you and I'll see you down the road. Um, we are, this is literally the second to last day of fundraising at CKUA. It was over last weekend. However, there's still some W dollar money in a pool that was offered up by leadership. And I know I just looked at the screen and the screen is still open. They're still taking donations. I'm wondering if you could speak directly to the audience listening here to us today on this Saturday and just well, ask them to, to uh, why it's important to um, support CKUA. Well, aside from my own, for want of a better word, sentimental feelings about CKUA, I, 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 it's been worthy of support from the get go there aren't that many stations around that have the variety of music and the, uh, I think, how can I word it, creative integrity that I sense from CKUA. And I think that is worth support. People the world over should you send you guys buckets of money. <laughs> Thank you, sir. 
uh, have yourself a whatever, wherever the tour takes you, just uh, en- enjoy the the wash of applause and, and acceptance and and thank you for the music. Well, thank you for paying attention to it. It's much appreciated. <laughs>